You gave a really interesting farewell speech in the House that I want to play a little bit of because it lays out some of what you were alluding to earlier about your view of the current state of our government. Um, and I also think it raises what I consider to be one of the most important political issues of our time. So let's roll that excerpt from your 2022 farewell address to Congress. I rise today for the last time as a member of the 117th Congress. I do not seek to dwell on the circumstances of my departure, although it does bring to mind a few lines from Yates's second coming. The best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Perhaps it takes a cataclysm like World War I to capture the naked and malevolent cynicism of our politics. Yates also well captured the harrowing consequence of elite ineptitude that precipitated the slaughter of tens of millions. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. I read and reread those words while flying out of Hamid Karzai International Airport last August during the shameful end to 20 years of America's war <clears throat> in Afghanistan. What I saw on the ground during that waking nightmare exemplified some of the best of the American men and women in uniform, but it also reflected the haplessness and incompetency of American policymaking. The failure of our war in Afghanistan, a failure abetted by decades of Congress's lax oversight of the president and his Department of Defense. To solve this, I pushed for Congress to take back its war powers, to take back that constitutional responsibility. But even when it comes to Congress asserting its own prerogative, this body has shown itself unwilling to do its job. The current budget negotiations taking place on the other side of the rotunda also show a Congress unwilling to confront the very basic task of passing a budget on time. The last time we had a budget passed before the fiscal year started, I was in second grade. When Congress is incapable of solving problems of its own making, how can the American people have any faith that we can tackle the problems arising from the broader world? What hope do we have of outcompeting China, of winning this coming century, if we can't even get out of a mess of our own making? We need the best to regain their convictions, to set an example of what clear-eyed leadership looks like both at home and abroad. We need to hold the worst to account and reprise the moral resolve that has led us through dark times in this country many, many times before. Too many have sacrificed too much for us to squander the opportunity before us, the opportunity to rise to the challenge of this moment, to set aside petty squabbles, the opportunity to build on the promise of limited government, economic freedom, and individual liberty, the promise that underpins the American dream. So the more power not, stuff. I've yeah. not seen that in you know close to two years. Oh. Well, well, how do, how do you feel, how do you feel rewatching it? Like, do you feel like it all rings totally true today? Do you wish you'd hit any different points? Um, you know, it, it, those were the moments where I was still aggressively campaigning and, and petitioning and spending a lot of time on the Senate side uh, to get the Afghan Adjustment Act passed to try mm -hmm. to get that into the you know NDAA or into that omnibus that was being worked on, um, and you know because that was a, a deeply personal kind of issue and it was. Yeah something that we were so close to being able to get. Um, it, ironically enough, and it got zero attention, this that um, Afghan Adjustment Act, which you know, would offer some stability and kind of certainty for the folks that you know, had supported US forces in Afghanistan that we had evacuated, uh, some of whom you know, were still in the process of, of kind of evacuate, evacuating and resettling uh, to give them you know, some permanence as opposed to the, the kind of temporary status many of them are on. Um, and it's an, an unholy mess of, of a kind of bureaucratic conundrum they're in. Uh, and so that that was, I would say, my, my kind of main focus. Um, you know, I don't know, and I hadn't even kind of thought about it. My, my campaign launch video hit a lot of those same themes, um, you know, despite, you know, I probably should have done some of my research and look back at, you know, those words, but, you know, were things I clearly and deeply believe and, and think are, you know, still very much ring true. Um, you know, I think if you don't have, you know, a, again, a good balance of power between the executive and the legislative branch, I think 
well, if I can just kind of step back, there's a lot of folks who think our our chaos in our system right now is is a a product of political chaos. That because of how chaotic our politics are, you know, our government can't function. And that's what I thought going in today. I, I'm a big believer. It gets the causality backwards. That the more our government screws up, uh, that the more you know the American people feel the consequences of inept policy making, uh, the more they reach for you know, replacements for alternatives, um, you know, for explanations for why that individual, when they got into office, couldn't do the things they promised to be able to do. Uh, so, you know, you, this guy didn't get the job done. So we're going to vote him out and send in somebody who's even more emphatic that they'll do it. Hmm. And so much of the challenge though, is the power has been stripped from many of those offices in Congress. You know, either Congress has, has let the executive take it, has given it to the executive or the executive is just, you know, taking that over. And so the basic kind of mechanical function of our government is broken. And that's where then, you know, you have that promotion of extreme, you know, and, and ever more chaotic politics. If there were fewer things the government was screwing up, you know, there'd always be people who were dissatisfied, but, you know, we'd find less purchase. You wouldn't be fertilizing the same ground, you know, that those kind of seeds of, of mistrust, um, you know, can be planted in. And so I'm, I think it's a, it's a complicated thing. So you start talking about legislative supremacy and, and notions of, of subsidiarity and, you know, gener generic concepts. Um, there it's challenging to get that done, not impossible, but challenging to get it done in Washington because so many there's, uh, every legislator will look at a policy, um, and want need to see a very concrete upside because the downside is always theoretically exponential. You know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Or if it is broke, um, you know, try not to fix it because no matter what you do, if you get your fingerprints on it, you know, you, you might, uh, be held to blame, even if your efforts were all well and good and pure of heart. And that's when I, you know, it's easy to kind of throw up your hands at that challenge. Um, but to me, the art of government is trying to say, okay, politics is the art of the possible. You know, how do you find ways in which you can make you know a concrete lasting effort it's a lot easier to do that if you're getting at some of the structures underpinning responses to issues than if you're just oh. getting distracted by the issues at hand. You need to deal with and react to those issues, but you also have to be able to get out of that reactive mindset to be able to put forward, you know, a vision and also backwards plan. You know, how do you get from that vision? How do you get to that vision from where we are? You know, what is that pathway? Could you talk about that, the structural issue as it pertains to foreign policy and the balance of powers? Because I know it's something you have been very focused on, um, that the, something you raised there is an attempt to make Congress exercise its war powers and sort of rebalance between con uh, legislative and executive branches, which I think is extremely important uh, when we're talking about the federal government. What are you hoping to accomplish on that front to, uh, if you make it back to D.C.? Yeah, I, I think you need I approach a lot of these with sort of a, a policy agnostic, but, you know, process obsessive mindset. Um, you know, if you think about war powers, I think oftentimes it's you know within the context of, oh, we need to end this war and that's why we need to repeal it. I, I mentioned the example of uh, the war on terror, you know, 2001 thereafter had that authorization for the use of military force that was passed shortly after 9-11, had that had a, a sunset every two years or, or four years or six years, um, probably six is too high, but you know, two years, three years, five years, something within that band, it's not necessarily saying that nothing would happen after that five-year period. You know, it's saying that there would have to be far more frequent engagement by the Department of Defense, you know, by the you know national security community with Congress. Uh, and Congress would because they'd have to cast a vote, you know, our senators and representatives would have to be casting an affirmative vote either in favor of continuing or uh, in opposition to continuing uh, military uh, you know, efforts. They would be asking better questions. They would feel more of a sense of ownership. They would have to articulate and defend. They would, but in the process of asking those more difficult questions, the Department of Defense would also have to sharpen its pencils. Our policymakers on the national security side would have to more firmly articulate and align their efforts with what they were saying, right? This notion that if we're just going to be hands off, everything will be fine, I think is has become so detrimental and so ruinous 
because you have sort of a defense policy establishment that um, essentially looks at Congress as a body to avoid. I mean, I, there were a couple of times where I would we'd be getting a, a classified briefing and I would say, oh my God, thank, thank God we're finally getting you know a briefing on, on issue X. Uh, I've been waiting for a while. And then I turn around and realize, you know, it was sort of, um, it was kind of like, a, you know, you realize they're trying to sell you a timeshare, you know, like it was, you know, yeah, we need your support on, you know, this bill or this authorization. And so we're telling you how big of a problem uh, is going on in this region, not because you should be aware, not because it should be informing, you know, how you're approaching something, but because we're going to have to ask you for something. And so if, yeah. if the executive had to ask Congress for more, the amount of transparency would be higher. The, the the feeling of responsibility among members would be higher, and you know I think it, it things would just function better. Again, would that lead to less or more? Um, I think there's there's arguments to be made in, in kind of either direction. But if we look at the strikes that you know the president has just conducted recently against the Houthis, against Iranian-backed groups in um, in Iraq, in Syria, you know both are are picking from a variety of different. Uh, you know, con authorizations coming from the Constitution, whether it's um, Article Two, kind of defense powers of the president uh, in in a self defense capacity, or you know, Article One authorities from authorizations through use of military force that were passed in two thousand one or two thousand two. Again, it, it just is doing an end run. It is it failing to engage, and I think it allows the American people to check out because their representatives are checked out. Um, and that type of lack of transparency, of, of lack of attention, of, of lack of concern, um, I think ultimately only dooms those projects to failure. Because then when people start to do pay attention after something bad happens, you know, they catch themselves up on 20 years and in the span of a you know two minute TikTok video. And that's probably yeah. not going to be conveying an accurate. I reality. mean, I could I could I could tell from that speech that your experience serving overseas, you brought a certain you you had a you were almost like personally insulted by the way that these wars have been conducted over the past couple of decades. Like wh what is it that th this sort of I don't know half uh, half hazard or just like rubber stamping type approach why is that particularly insulting and damaging to the people who serve in the military yeah, it just shows a disregard right it, it, i think uh, you know I, I, by way of background i was in iraq as a soldier doing intelligence operations and in, in, you know uh 2020 sorry 2010 and 2011 and then i was in afghanistan uh, as an NGO conflict analyst for the humanitarian aid community. So, you know, no uniform, no weapons, neutral living on the economy uh, from 2013 to 2015. And, you know, I think in both of those conflicts, we found ourselves with allies of convenience that just looked at the U.S. as an entity to exploit. Um, we didn't necessarily have any specific strategy or objective or, or goal we were going towards, uh, or if we did, it would change frequently enough that, you know, what we were doing was never aligned towards any specific intent. Um, you know, that notion of a self-licking ice cream cone. And the reality is that the entire time you're there, I mean, there's a risk that you're undertaking. American service members are dying. Um, you know, again, I don't reflexively say, oh, you got to bring everyone home or there's no scenario in which we should be in some of those areas. But it, our policymakers sure as hell need to articulate why those risks are being undertaken, to what end, you know, what are those terms? Um, and, and how often would those be reevaluated? Because I think the majority of the war on terror, or at least our kind of post 9-11 moment, has been, you know, this linear sense of engagement where it's like, okay, we're either going to maybe some sanctions, then we're going to have some airstrikes, maybe a special forces raid, uh, maybe, you know, the Marines will go in and be, you know, temporary, or maybe we're going to hold and build with kind of large conventional forces. And it's like, okay, well, to, to what end? What's our goal? Yeah. Yeah. And have our efforts helped achieve whatever that goal is, but you can't even measure if they've been effective if you don't have a consistent goal or you keep changing it. And again, lives hang in the balance. Civilian lives are lost. Military service members' lives are lost. And the taxpayer is footing the bill for all of that. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from our new show, Just Asking Questions. You can watch another clip here or the full episode here. New episodes drop every week, so subscribe to Reason TV's YouTube channel to get notified when that happens.
or to the Just Asking Questions podcast on Apple, Spotify, or any other podcatcher. See you next week.